So we're moving on to chapter 11 now. I'm going to discuss fluid statics. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the course, fluid mechanics deals with both fluid statics and fluid dynamics. We're going to start with fluid statics, which means that we're going to be looking at fluids at rest. So really the only stress that we're going to uh, be concerned with is the normal stress, which is pressure. And the pressure, as you can imagine, is going to vary with the depth or based on the weight of the fluid acting on a body. Now most of our analyses for this chapter are going to deal with submerged bodies. So it could be a gate, a dam, uh, some type of liquid storage tank. Uh, I mean, so we're going to be looking at different things. So here's Hoover Dam. And we're going to be looking at maybe what's the hydrostatic forces acting on this. So can you imagine, you know, how tall this is? What are the forces acting on the bottom of this or, or where the uh, force is acting uh, based on the weight of that liquid? So there's a few ways we can do this analysis. What we are going to do pretty much for every problem is we'll assume that this atmospheric pressure acts on both sides of this dam, for example. So a lot of times we'll look at a gate or we'll look at a um, some type of wall. And we can a lot of times assume that atmospheric pressure acts on both this side of the wall and this side of the wall helping our analysis be a little bit simpler. If the atmospheric pressure does not act on one side of the wall, we do need to take it into account. So uh, one of the things here is determining, one, the magnitude of the pressure that we're interested in. How big is it? And a second concern is the location at which the pressure acts. So that location is going to be called the center of pressure. So uh, so this looks like a mess, okay? But it's not as bad as it seems. So first thing we're going to be interested in is finding what's the, called the resultant force, or that's the magnitude of the force that we're dealing with. And to find the magnitude of the force that we're dealing with, we're simply going to take our pressure whatever initial pressure we have and for the most part this P naught is going to be zero remember we discussed that earlier where the uh, atmospheric pressure we're considering is zero times rho G H sub C and H sub C here is expressed as the distance from the surface of the water to the centroid of our shape okay so here in this case our shape is some bean shape thing and the centroid of this is right here. So the distance from right here to the surface of this water is going to be our y sub c. If we take y sub c times sine theta, it would be the same as h sub c, or the distance between the surface of the water and our centroid. Okay? So we're really interested in this distance, rho g h sub c. That's going to give us how much force is acting on our body. Now the second question is where does it act? And of course to convert this pressure to a force we multiply it by area. But our question is uh, where does this act? At what point? Does it act at the centroid? Pretty close. But we're going to consider it to act just below the centroid where we're going to call this the center of pressure. So the location of the center of pressure, once we know the magnitude, we, we find the location, which is called y sub p. If we know that, then we can design our gate, right? Because this is causing a moment to occur about some hinge, or this is causing some force to act across a certain distance. So we can design our gates, we can design our system to be able to withstand this force that is being caused by this weight of the water on one side of it. 
Now this is the primary equation we'll be using. So y sub p, or the location where the force acts, is equal to the distance from the surface of the water to the centroid, okay? Plus this. And this is just what I'm going to call a little bit, okay? So it's the centroid, the distance from the surface to the centroid, plus a little bit more. So this is a little bit, okay? So like I mentioned to you before, okay, a lot of times we're going to be ignoring this term here. So I'm, let me just, let's just consider this one, okay? Let me move this over here. So let's look at this term. Y sub C plus a little bit. This term is the moment of inertia. And this is going to depend on the geometry that we're dealing with. That is divided by Y sub C times area. If you're interested in where this formula comes from, you can check your text and it gives you a description of how they came about this, um, this derivation. So in your text, the moment of inertia is given here for many different geometries so on an example problem I may give you let's say we have a triangular gate and I want you to find where the force acts if the water is up here the force would act at the centroid plus a little bit and we would calculate what that little bit is using this so the force is going to act at the centroid plus a little bit more and we'll use all these different uh, um, values here to calculate that. So on this table, you'll see there's a um, value for the moment of inertia. And there's also the area given for each one of these shapes. Uh, here's just another way of calculating it. This is a pressure prism. If you integrate all of this, it come out to be uh, giving you the resultant force. So that's just another method. So here, uh, here's a special case. So if we plug in all of the moment of inertias, if we plug in all of those values um, for a rectangular plate that's submerged, okay, this is a special case for a rectangular plate that's submerged. That means if you have a triangular plate, you can't use this equation. If you have a circular plate, you can't use these equations. You would have to use the general analysis, which is finding the resultant force and then finding the location where it acts. But here, we are just going to describe this particular case. So this takes into account the distance that this plate is submerged, S plus B over 2, which is Y sub C, right? This is going to be Y sub C. S plus B over 2 is Y sub C plus a little bit and this is the moment of inertia for this rectangular plate and here is the um, other uh, bottom portion so here let's look at our term oops y sub c times a here we have y sub c which is s plus b over 2 and remember we'll typically ignore this times the area which is a b okay so there's different, the book provides you a different, because we, a lot of times we deal with rectangular things, right? I mean, a, a lot of, in practice, many different things are shaped in a rectangular fashion. But we may use, and consider some other geometries simply for um, practice. And because you may actually experience some different geometries in practice yourself. So if this was totally, totally upright, you know, we would perform our analysis like this. If S equals zero, or if the plate is brought up all the way up to the surface, we would eliminate that. So it would just be rho G H, uh, H sub C, okay? And of course here, uh, it would all be the same. Remember, the pressure is all the same along a certain distance in the horizontal direction. So just rho G H. Finally, I want to talk about buoyancy in fluid statics. So basically, buoyant forces are going to be forces caused by the displacement of the fluid that we're in. Okay, so really doesn't have anything to do with the actual whatever material we're putting into the fluid. Okay, 
has to do with the volume of the material that we're putting into the fluid. Okay, so it's, if this material here displaces um, one meter cubed of water, that all of that weight that it's displacing is going to be acting as an upward force pushing this to the surface or pushing it upward in the up direction, the opposite direction to this uh, weight force here, okay? So here, basically what I just said can be summarized by Archimedes' principle, and that is the buoyant force acting on the body immersed in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body, and it acts upward through the centroid. So we'll be looking at the forces acting in the centroid of whatever body that we're dealing with. A great example of that is a hot air balloon, which you know we fill up with lighter density air so it has a weight all of this you know the material cloth the basket the people inside the basket all of that has a weight acting downward but the amount of air that we're displacing has a greater weight that's why the net force is acting upwards because we're displacing more weight of air than this entire system ways. Okay, hope that makes sense. We'll work some practice problems here to illustrate both fluid statics and buoyant force.